this shows that in any given year, eventually the party stops. And when the party stops, it hurts the most overpriced companies the most. All right, guys, so we're gonna do something a little bit different in this video today. Um, so first off, we go through a lot of numbers. So if you're new to the channel and you're not used to this kind of bam, 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 don't worry. Just get what you can out of it. Rewatch the video, do whatever you can. Um, for those of you who already subscribed to the channel and subscribed to our community, keep repeating this stuff. I do this data over and over, not just for content for our channel, right, Mo? Like yeah, we talk about repetition. this stuff. It's just repetition. I reread the same books. I read new books that say the same thing over and over because I'm trying to get myself to know and believe exactly what I read. So if you remember in the last couple of years and if you're new to the channel, we kept saying all these stocks are overpriced, so much hype. And I always said the most overpriced stocks would fall the hardest when time finally did come. Yep, and that seems like that time is approaching slash here. Well, the NASDAQ 100, we said was very overpriced. The NASDAQ 100 is down how much this year? I think it was 16.5 or something as its peak, and wow. now it's 10.3. Wow. Just go year, year to, to date. date. Minus 34 and a quarter percent. So 34%. Call it 33 and a half with dividends. Yep. And the S&P is down about, about 20%. 20% this year, yep. So we said the NASDAQ 100 was the most overpriced. We always tell people the more overpriced the company, the harder it'll fall when times get back to normal. Exactly. We talked about Tesla being overpriced. We talked about even Apple to us was overpriced, Microsoft, Google, all these things. What was that? Google, Amazon. We said they were overpriced. And now people are looking for any excuse. Well, you didn't say the interest rates were going to sky. I said, well, yeah, I actually did. I said, interest rates are going to go up from here. Mm -hmm. So if your justification for buying stocks, now did I say it was going to go up 5% in one year? No. But guys, the analogy I always bring is if you know people have gotten divorced, it was never the last fight that really caused the divorce. It was the buildup. It was the constant fighting. And finally, one day, he left the milk out again. Finally, one day, she didn't respond to a request of his or whatever it was. The point is, there was a buildup. Overvaluation is the buildup. And I now have some evidence to show you, now that we're at the end of the year, yep. on how the most overvalued stocks did. So I went and downloaded the 1,170 stocks above the market cap of $10 billion. Okay. So I sat here and I ranked them all by year to date price change. So okay. which ones had the biggest falls? Okay. Then I looked at their PE ratio currently. Now I assumed a PE ratio. I extrapolated it backwards. I took this PE ratio and said, what would it have to be? What would the PE ratio have to have been to start for the 69% drop to lead to this PE ratio? So I worked backwards and here are the PE ratios. Now the biggest falls. I divided them all up into one, two, three, four, five sections ranked by biggest fall. And guess what, guys? These were the average PEs of the worst ranking group. This is the average PEs of the second ranking group. This is the average PEs of the third. What do you see as consistent? The average PEs are going down as their returns go up. Hmm. So this is the, 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 bottom, the bottom 20 percentile of PEs actually are up 37.3% this year. They were fair valued. Because they were fair valued. Now I'm not saying they were good value or bad, no, but exactly. isn't it? They were closest to quote unquote fair value based on PE. But isn't it weird how this all works out? <laughs> Literally, as the PE goes down to start the year, the return goes up. This is not coincidence, people. I've said this a thousand times. If I give you a stream of cash flow, $1, $2, $3, $4, one, two, three, four. That's a total of $10 of cash flow in the next four years. If you pay $1, your $1 becomes $10. If you pay $5, your $5 becomes $10. It still becomes $10. It's still $10 of cash flow. What you pay for dictates your return. This is how much return? 900%, Thank I you. believe. This is 100%. The only difference here is price you paid. That's all that, that all that changed it. And all this Excel sheet does is tells you the more you paid for a dollar of earnings, the average here is 55 and a half. The average here is 22. The less your return was. Now, what you've been accustomed to in the last few years has been what, Mo? High PEs, pay whatever. It's going to stay there or it's going to go higher. How do they become high? People just keep buying them up. So when you're in that mode, mode, 
Or if you buy a stock and it just goes up and up and up, you have FOMO. You start to forget that every investment is a present value of all future cash flow. We have almost 2,000 videos in this channel. It might be over 2,000 now. I don't know. And I've probably said that in 1,500 of the videos. <laughs> every investment is the present value of all future cash flow. For those of you who, who follow me on Instagram, I get so many messages on Instagram and people will send me a message saying, don't these people get it? Every investment is the present value of all future cash flow. No, they don't get it. And guys, that's not something I'm just making up. That's an absolute fact. Let me tell you, you might sit there and say, well, Paul, art doesn't have a cash flow. First off, I think art speculation, but you're, but you're wrong. Art does have a cash flow. If you pay $100 for an art piece today and 20 years later, you sell it for 1,000, you have 19 zeros along the way and one final $1,000. And that can be brought all the way back to determine your internal rate of return or your ROI. Cash flow doesn't have to be every single year. Look at it this way. When I buy a piece of real estate, I tend to not cash flow for a few years because I'm putting money back into the real estate. I'm trying to upgrade units to get much higher cash flow. And I'm okay with that because I want to get higher cash flow later. Higher cash flow later that more than makes up for that loss of cash flow along the way. So, I back. Find, go ahead, Bo. I find it interesting. So I'm trying to find it, uh, Apple here, for example. If you pull up that sheet again, and I'm just correlating this back to the almost a little book that beats the market or our back test that we've done. Not that PE is the greatest value strategy out there ever, but it just shows. If any, you, actually, if you any, actually go buy any type of metric, I mean, you can look at ROIC, you can look at debt, you can just do something as simple as buying the lowest PEs. Well, and this, <laughs> this shows that it works because exactly this, it would be one thing if these were showing random numbers. Yeah. If they were all over the place. They're all over the place. Like this one does plus 40%. This one's minus 25. This one's plus 20, but it doesn't. It's just going right along the way. The higher the P, the the lower the PE, the higher the return. And the further and further you go out, I guarantee if we look back at the last 10 years, it'll probably show even more correlation to that. Because every investment is the present value of all future cash flow. That's it. This shows that in any given year, eventually the party stops. And when the party stops, it hurts the most overpriced companies the most. By far, the more overhyped and bubblicious the companies are, the more they're going to fall. It's no coincidence that crypto is down 70% this year. The party finally stopped. And it's probably going to get worse for all these companies. Does that, or, and crypto, does that mean that 2023 is going to be a down year? I don't know what it's going to be. Any given year has a 50-50 chance of being up or down. However, if I'm betting over the next 10 years, my guess is along the way, we're going to see much lower values than we have today. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm guessing. And my goal will be to buy as they fall lower and lower. Mm -hmm. It seems like the tech party is over too, because this is QQQ, pretty tech heavy. And you can just see the steady decline that's been going on. Yeah. And guys, go look at 2000. Go look at 2007, 2008. In 2000, it was a dot-com bubble. This is the same story over and over, just different characters. 2007 and eight, it was real estate. Now it's EV and it's uh, crypto. Okay, that's it. There'll be another one in the future. And we'll be having this conversation again in the future, but it'll be something else. And that's what I want you to remember. So if you're new to this channel, and what I'm saying when it kind of makes you go, wait, I never thought of it that way. Subscribe to the channel, watch a few more videos, because the more you learn, the less you'll fear. And that's the big key here. The less you fear, the smarter decisions you can make. Because successful investing isn't just about understanding these Excel sheets. That's about 10% of it. 90% of it is emotion, mindset, temperament. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. There are three things that you absolutely need in order to be a successful investor. The proper mindset, the proper emotion, and the proper process. Which ones are the most important? 